In March 2021, The Guardian revealed that Premier League clubs had spent a combined £272 million on agents' fees over the previous 12 months, with Chelsea the highest spenders on £35.2 million, West Brom the lowest on £4.2 million, and Gillingham the only club in the top four divisions of English football to not pay anything. And weirdly, this represented an increase on the year before, despite top flight clubs making huge losses in the pandemic, and with transfer spending decreasing by 10.6% between 2019 and 2020. Figures like this suggest that the power that football agents hold in the game is continuing to grow, with their profits increasing even as those in other areas of the industry plummet. According to Forbes, Jonathan Barnett, George Mendes and Mino Raiola all rank among the top five most lucrative sports agents in the world, making more money from their profession than any agent working in basketball or American football. And according to Build, Raiola will demand wages of £825,000 a week for his most sought-after client, Erling Haaland as well as agent fees totaling almost £35 million once the Norwegian striker's release clause comes into effect next summer. But why are figures like Raiola able to exploit the transfer market like this? On today's FD Explained, we aim to find out. To understand why football agents profit so handsomely from the beautiful game, we must first establish what exactly it is they do, and take a look at how they become so powerful. The exact responsibilities they hold varies from agent to agent, and can include giving guidance on lifestyles and finances, helping secure commercial deals for their clients, and representing them in contract and transfer negotiations, often getting a 5-10% cut of earnings agreed in said negotiations. With FIFA allowing agents or intermediaries, as they're also known, to charge commission rates as high as this, as opposed to the NFL and NBA for example, only allow them to charge 3% and 4% respectively, it therefore explains why the biggest intermediaries working in football earn more than their American counterparts. And it's this aspect of an agent's job, negotiating transfers and wages, which has put them increasingly under the spotlight over the last 20 years. Acting as a middleman between the player, the selling club and buying club, and sometimes even working for all three parties in tandem, agents can potentially bag millions in commission for their work in brokering a deal, with the likes of Mendes and Raiola labelled super agents for the empires they have built. But the concept of a super agent is still a relatively new one. Agents have existed in some form throughout the history of the game. As far back as the late 1800s and the advent of professional football, they were hired by clubs to perform a scouting-style role, seeking out talent as the transfer market began to emerge. By the end of the 1950s, they were also working for footballers, with the long-standing salary cap that existed within English football forcing players to seek out other means of income from public appearances to advertising and playing in friendly matches. And following the abolition of the salary cap in 1961, negotiating higher wages for players suddenly became a much bigger part of the job for agents who had previously worked primarily on behalf of clubs. According to a study done by Sporting Intelligence, the average salary in the English top flight more than doubled between 1961 and 1966, with George Best becoming the first £1,000 a week player in 1968. But it wasn't until 1994 that FIFA decided to take a conclusive stand on the role of agents, as rising wages and reports of unethical behaviour saw pressure build on authorities to implement regulations. For the first time, the international governing body formally recognised the profession, and introduced a licensing system whereby football associations in each country had to set out rules for agents to become registered, involving background checks, exams and bank guarantees. And just a year later, the Bosman ruling which stipulated that clubs were no longer able to block players from joining rivals in other countries at the end of their contract, and ban quotas on players moving between EU member states, gave footballers more power over their employers. Coupled with the rapid commercialisation which was already afoot in the European game, this heralded a new era of rising transfer fees and wages, with the average Premier League salary increasing from just under £4,000 a week in 1995 to over £11,000 a week in the year 2000. In 1999, Roy Keane became the first Premier League player to earn £50,000 a week, and within two years, Sol Campbell had doubled it following his own Bosman transfer between Tottenham and Arsenal. Now earning a lot more money, it was becoming increasingly important for top-level players to hire agents with a deep knowledge of the football market who could look out for their best interests, whether it be securing them big contracts or a move to a better club. And no more so was this the case than with David Beckham. The English midfielder was the sport's biggest superstar in the early 2000s, and the value of his global brand, boosted by partnerships with Adidas and Pepsi, 
meant he was one of the first players for whom image rights played a major role in contract negotiations. When he signed a new contract with Man United in 2002, it was reported that £20,000 a week was negotiated for the use of his name and image on club merchandise alone. With negotiations over this detail going on for months after his base salary had been agreed, Tony Stevens, the man who negotiated Alan Shearer's world record transfer fee to Newcastle in 1995, had represented Beckham since he was a teenager. The European marketing director of entertainment company SFX, Stevens was instrumental in securing the midfielder's commercial partnerships, worth a reported £17 million at the time, as well as leading his contract negotiations at Old Trafford and putting in motion his move to Real Madrid in 2003. The pair's relationship was at the heart of Beckham's commercial success. The England captain considered the agent one of his closest friends, even saying that Stevens knew him better than anyone else in the world. By this point, Italian agent Mino Raiola had already been in the profession for over a decade and was beginning to turn heads after brokering Pavel Nedved's 41 million euro switch from Lazio to Juventus. Like Stevens and Beckham, Raiola had been known to build close relationships with his clients, advising players from a young age on their career prospects, financial management, and aspects of their day to day lives. As the Financial Times' Simon Cooper wrote in 2016, he keeps his stable of players small so as to offer each one a personal service, and he also puts in time and effort to make sure that he's working for the right clients. In his autobiography, Zlatan Ibrahimovic revealed his first encounter with Raiola, in which the agent asked him, do you want to be the best in the world or the player who earns most and can show off the most stuff? When the player rang him up afterwards to ask him to represent him, the agent made a firm request. Sell your cars, your watches, and start training three times as hard, because your stats are rubbish. Ibrahimovic heeded his advice, and within months, Raiola had bagged him a move from Ajax to Juventus, using the good rapport he'd built with Biancaneri CEO Luciano Moji to help get the deal done. And just as he has worked tooth and nail to push his clients to new heights and bag them the best possible deals, the Italian agent has also made some enemies along the way, with Sir Alex Ferguson infamously saying he distrusted him from the moment he met him. He's also used unorthodox tactics in order to meet his aims. In 2005, Raiola claimed Real Madrid had offered Juventus 70 million euros for Zlatan Ibrahimovic, with some seeing it as a ploy to drive up his market value and wages. And in 2016, a Dio Spiegel report based on documents obtained by Football Leaks alleged that Raiola had strong-armed Borussia Dortmund into selling Henrik Mkhitaryan to Man United with a clause in his agent contract that would have compelled the club to pay him millions in compensation if they rejected the English club's offer. That same year, it was confirmed that Juventus had paid him £24 million for his role in brokering Paul Pogba's move to Old Trafford, and reports soon emerged that he had received a combined £41 million from Juve, United and the player. These kind of stories and the money involved has led many fans and journalists to view agents as a problem within the game. After finding out Raiola's fee for the Pogba transfer, former FA chairman David Bernstein branded it immoral while former Crystal Palace chairman Simon Jordan has referred to agents as evil, divisive scum, and wrote in 2019, at the centre of 90% of controversies, conflicts and corruption in football is the involvement of agents. However, this isn't entirely fair. As former agent Jonathan Booker wrote this year, quite often the criticism of some agents is well deserved, but more often than not, the headlines are skewed and misrepresented to feed already common caricatures of what is a very misunderstood industry where agents are clumped together. While Raiola's tendency to create media storms and George Mendes' run-ins with the law have cast a shadow over the industry for many, there remain thousands of agents we don't hear about, making far less money, avoiding controversy and still negotiating excellent deals for their clients. But even for those agents, at least the ones working in the top flight, it remains a lucrative business. According to sports management worldwide, agents earn between £1,200 and £550,000 per Premier League client every year. But more recently, there's been a growing sense that footballers don't always need professionals to help them when it comes to the financial matters of their job. Kevin De Bruyne famously negotiated his new contract with Manchester City earlier this year, though he admitted he would have requested assistance had he been pushing for a move away. And in England, at least, the government is seemingly keen to crack down on irregularities in the system. According to accountancy firm UHY, the number of footballers being investigated by the UK tax authorities almost tripled between 2018-19 and 2019-20, while the number of agents under investigation more than doubled a tax loophole relating to image rights the prime concern. 
and in February 2021, it was revealed that FIFA intended to become title and agents once again, with its decision to deregulate the industry in 2015 a move which made it much easier for anyone to become an intermediary, receiving criticism at the time. Chief Legal Officer Emilio Garcia Silvero has now admitted that was a mistake, and they've now proposed plans for new caps on agent commissions for player transfers, plus the reintroduction of a licensing scheme to raise professional standards in the industry. But as long as footballers continue to earn huge wages, they will always need professional assistance to manage their assets and paperwork. In short, while regulation may help to keep out those unqualified for the job, super agents and the power they hold within the game aren't going away anytime soon. And that's all we have time for today, but if you enjoyed this episode, do give it a like and leave a comment. Let us know what you'd like to see us cover next. And finally, for more daily content, make sure you subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next time.